Hello everybody, welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. We're going to have a little bit of a technological challenge today. My apologies to that. We're going to have Tim Blotzer on the program here in just a second. Anyway, sorry for a little bit of delay. We we're uh, trying to get to some calls connected, but we will make it all worthwhile. Um, just for reference, I've had a ton of questions from just about everybody on cryptocurrencies. I'm almost overwhelmed with all the questions regarding crypto. What I'm going to do is I will um, probably hold all of those for Friday's show. And we'll do everything on uh, our Friday show with regards to crypto and get all those questions answered. So today's topic du jour, and it's going to may sound a little bit funny, guys. I'm doing, uh, Tim is going to be actually on my phone, which is connected to my, uh, leaning on my speaker over here, my microphone over here. So we could have a, a little bit of an issue today. We'll do our best. Uh, is going to be called Three Paydays a Week with Tim Blotzer joining us on the phone, who's literally on the phone today. How you doing, Tim? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> Good. I'm hoping this technology the... thing won't last. Uh, I hope no. Hopefully, guys, let me know if it sounds uh, the audio sounds okay. I'll do my best to try to dial in Tim a little bit better here. But I think I've got it. Everything looks okay on my end. Today we are going to talk about. Um, I guess something that's a little bit unique. Some of you who have watched this program for quite some time, you know that uh, Tim Blotzer has a strategy called the Rubber Ducky, which you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Trader Merlin, and type in Rubber Ducky and probably find all about it there. Today we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and then go into some earnings play pieces, but I think what makes this unique, everyone, is when we look at equities, when we look at Forex, when we look at futures, generally there's going to be... Uh, it's an open-ended trade, meaning you can buy something and sell it whenever you want. You can sell it in 30 seconds, you can sell it next month, next year, depends on what that investment is. So today's topic will be really this, the three paydays a week. And Tim, talk to me a little bit about your three paydays a week strategy. Well, basically it's on the SPX, the S&P 500. It has Monday, Wednesday, Friday expirations, plenty of liquidity, and it pays well. And I look for high probability trades and I don't have to be right. Because, you know, trading directionally, I have to be right on everything. And I'm not, as obviously by this call, you can see I'm not always right. <laughs> and I can still be wrong and make money. That's okay. And I see that the Russell, I think the RUT just went to three day a week expirations. And I haven't tested that one out yet. So, but. I get in Monday, and it's, and it's done Monday. I get in Wednesday, it's done Wednesday. I get in Friday, it's done Friday. And yesterday, I ended up with two rubber duckies. And basically, the rubber ducky is just a different way of creating an iron condor. An iron condor, you do all four legs to get in and all four legs to get out. Well, I don't do that. I'll leg into a bear call and then leg into a bull put. When the market is going bullish, don't do a bear call because that's a bearish strategy. And when the market is going bearish, don't do a bull put. That's a bullish strategy. So you, you, you're you kind of, yeah, I guess you could say timing the market in terms. So like today, it started out, we gapped up, and it just kept going up, then went sideways. And this is the pattern the S&P 500 has been doing lately. We either gap up or gap down. And then we'll bounce around a little bit, and then we'll go sideways for a couple of hours, and then into the close, kind of like today, it started, you know, right at noon, dropping into the close. And so that would be the time to put on the bear call. And I usually wait till the last hour and a half of the day. So you you talk about you know you talk about three paydays. It's really not even uh, a full day. I mean you're just kind of watching, see what it does during the day. Then as you get in the last couple hours, you're saying, okay, I know these are going to expire in a couple of hours, and then you look for one that you say is higher probability, which you want to get to. But is that the gist of what I what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. And the the thing is, is ever since this mess started a year ago, it's been, you know, it, we're not fundamentally driven. We're not even to an extent not technically driven it's all about the news and so i you know used to first skip the first hour that's amateur hour well now it's i don't even start looking for a trade till 10 o'clock pacific time and then it's usually after 11 o'clock that i'll even consider putting on a trade and then what's been happening lately i watch at 11 30 what's the market doing well like today it didn't do much. It dipped a little bit, and then it went back up. 
And then, I hey, I'll watch it 12 o'clock, the last hour, and that's when we started going down, we reversed. So along the way, you could have done a bull put, and that, but that would have been all you would have done while it was continuing to go up. And then when it started to turn down in the last hour, okay, I can put on the bear call. And it's, there's no extra margin for that. Mm-hmm. So I just pick up extra premium. And it's just, and I use a one minute chart uh, and monitor the candles. You know, I always say the thing you need to get good at is reading the charts, know what strategy to apply based on what you see. And then you got to start. Yeah, that, that's those two are easy once you get used to it. But the three hardest things are the discipline, the patience, and following the rules. Do you find? I mean, because obviously this has been a refinement of years of. Years. Sort of yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, I would, I'm under the assumption that at a certain point you were doing trades right at the beginning right at the market open right so market opens you're in there making trades right away was there something that happened early on like you know you just got whipsawed too much or just bad trades that caused you to say you know what forget it i can do just as well just trading that last bit of the market yeah well first of all when i started out is i learned after getting kicked in the butt was to skip the first hour they call it amateur hour yep so I'd wait till later, and when I was trading directionally, we looked at a whole lot of different things. Then you look at MACD, stochastic, moving averages, Bollinger Bands, Fibonacci's, all that stuff. And that worked great till 2008. And then in 2008, buying calls didn't work so well anymore because I didn't know about the implied volatility having such an effect on the options. Well, and I bought puts through 2008, and even with the high volatility, at least the puts paid off. You know, if if the put costs too much, it doesn't. Even if it moves in your direction, it doesn't pay. Well, it worked out. And then mm-hmm. coming out of 2008, it's like, well, I wasn't ready to buy calls, and we started to climb up. So, nah, I'm not real sure. So I started doing spreads, and it was just, you know, stay above here, stay below there, and it was. Now, I don't have to be right. And it's, you know, trade what you see, not what you think or feel. And it's not the money you make, it's the money you keep. And so, basically, like I say, this is still in beta testing. I've only been doing it for 12 years. And so we'll have to see, almost 13. So we'll see if it works. But I'm not looking for the home runs. I'm just looking for base hits in three times a week. Right. And, if, and, you know, if I get 40 cents on a premium on each side on a bear call and a bull put, I get 8.7% and 8.7%. Well, 8 plus 8 is 19% when you put them together into the rubber ducky or the iron condor. Um, question from Sava, and it's a pretty good one. I think that the, this is part of the, the strategy there. It says, uh, where did it go? So, I thought you could all, oops. Um, so if you... I you get, uh, if you leg in, let's say it's a $5 wide spread, they don't require another $5 of margin withheld was the question from Sava. Right. So if I put on a bull put and it's a $5 spread, which I stick with $5 spreads, is, okay, they're holding $5,000 if I do 10 contracts or $500 if I'm doing one contract. But if I add a bear call, because it, it can't be up here and down here at the same time. So they're only going to hold margin on one side. So let's say I get 40 cents on the bull put and I get 40 cents on the bear call. Now I'm collecting 80 cents on a $5 spread. My max loss is 420, but that's not taking into account your your stop. So now I'm making 80 cents on 420 and that's a 19% return for the day. Well, for an hour or two. <laughs> mm-hmm. I kind of like it. I, I, I like it as well. Um, real quick, uh, obviously we all have, uh, was last Friday an outlier for you? I, I know we had that big rally near the end there. Um, COD33 says, how did you fare last Friday on uh, March 5th? Did that, did that type of end of the day mess with you? Uh, well, I'm looking at this, the last Friday we just had. Yep. I think it was a pretty good day. Uh because I'm looking, we gapped up, then went down, oops, yep. and then just took off and went to the races. And so, you know, like I said, I think I did it, 12.23 was my last trade on Friday. I did probably the bear call, 
because it was bull put all day, and I think I ended up with, with two bull puts and one bear call. But we ended up going sideways at the end of the day. And, and that's the other thing is, first of all, on Friday, you never know what's going to happen at the close because we've had big moves right at the close. Yep. Now, Monday, that last little bit, I, I had the 38.30 on Monday that I rolled till tomorrow, which turned out to be, thankfully, a good decision because when it took off today, I could have closed it for 40 cents, but, you know, I'm kind of greedy. I'll wait till tomorrow to close it because I rolled it from Monday to Wednesday. But uh, I also put on the 38.20 when I closed the 38.30 and picked up, I, I think it was 50 cents or so. And then uh, it went down and it was like, uh-oh. And in the last like 30 seconds, it closed above 39.20 <laughs> or 38.20. So, you know, it's, that's a Tums moment or Jack Daniels or whatever the adult beverage is. But the close has been screwy since last year. Yeah, well, I mean, closes, I mean, we all know that historically closes are, and opens are volatile. I mean, and I yeah. saw a comment in here about amateur hour. You know, that's just the industry term for that opening 20, 30 uh, minutes. Um, they call it amateur uh, hour, but really it's opening half hour, in my opinion. But that's just where order filling happens. People get whips out all the time. So uh, it's just an industry term. Um, you know, as an amateur, I spent a ton of time in there and I did pretty well. But um, most people get whips out and just torn apart there. You yeah. know, one of the challenge here, Tim, is when people go through a traditional education process. They're taught to look for something that has uh, you know, a risk of one, a reward of three, a reward right. of five. Right. You want that to be skewed in your favor. Right. For a lot of these trades though, it's it's reversed. Like you're looking, and, and this is a challenge for people to, to get, is you're looking for a reward of maybe one, but your risk might be three. Well, you gotta set a stop. Right. So it's it's not just my max loss that I'm, I'm risking. You know, set parameters, say, okay, you know, I got, 40 cents on this maybe you set a stop to get out at 80 cents or a dollar or whatever your your threshold is because it's you know you're not risking the whole of your risk you figure it's not on the entire amount you got to have a stop and that's going to save you more often than not and you know I wasn't I haven't been a big fan of rolling trades because it's you know I look at it I'm wrong on the trade let's close it and then let me make up the money and usually the max loss I'll take, and, and when the market's moving quick, you got to move quick because mm -hmm. it can go from you know 80 cents to close it to two dollars in a heartbeat. Right. But it's just you know, where's your threshold? And a lot of people use double the premium you collect. So if you get 40 cents, put your stop at 80 cents if it's going against you. But you know, remember a 10 percent move in the underlying could be a hundred percent move in the on the option. Right. So you got to be careful with that. I because I you know I consider this my job from 6:30 to one. I'm trading the market. I I have a cheat sheet that I use that I mark the futures, the VIX, the advancers, decliners, uh, and and see what is the movement in the market. And it was just like yesterday at the close. Find my sheet. Is it started to tell us. You know, the advances decliners went from minus 624 to minus 1100 to minus 800 to minus 1000 to minus 1100. That's telling me I got momentum to the downside. But the advances decliners is probably my third thing that I look at. The first is the futures. And the futures went from plus 36 to plus 8 to plus 20 to plus 250 at 12 o'clock in the last hour. Then went to minus 3 and then went to plus 3. And the VIX started out at almost 26, and we went down to 24, and then it started moving back up again in the in the last hour, hour and a half. And it's like, okay, the market's telling me, get ready for a move to the downside, and it did. Now, if with that, you mentioned, and, and I like this because what, and I try to glean from your, your, your comments, uh, things that might be educational, informative for everybody, there's a, a definitive process. So when you talk about this kind of three-day a week payday, um, you're looking at an options contract that expires three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you have yep. those definitive ends to that contract. Whereas I mentioned before, futures and forex stocks, they're open-ended, right? You could buy a stock right. and hold it in, until it goes bankrupt. Who cares how long it is? Right. This, though, there's that smaller window of time. So there's a different set of variables at play here. Second factor of his process is 
he's running through and it's not just saying well i think it's going to go this direction it's running through trends pattern analysis he talked about the futures markets he's checking out the vix he's checking out a variety of indicators advanced decliners these are his decision support system that are saying okay even though this trade may have a reward of one and a risk of three i'm going to mitigate that risk by using stops and not allowing the full max loss but i'm also going to even though it says it's got a reward of one i'm also going to increase the probability of me taking the right option trade selection because I have all this supporting background cast of information that's saying your your options table may say it's got a probability of this, but I'm going to give it an even greater probability because of all these other factors. Is that right? Right. Right. And I'm also looking at the delta. I'm looking for a delta between 5 and 18 because that gives me, you know, a uh, 95 to 80 something percent probability of being out of the money at expiration. And that's what I want. Ideally, but I do these trades. It's I'm I want it to expire worthless, you know. And people say all the time, "Oh, stay away from options; they expire worthless." Yeah, that's great if you sell them. Not so good if you buy them. And right. so it's getting in, and it's you know, like I said, these days it's in the last hour, hour and a half before I even consider putting on a trade. Now, if it's a drastic mood like we had last Friday, where it was up all day once it bounced. It was, okay, put on a bull put, and then it hasn't turned over yet, put on another bull put. Mm -hmm. Again, don't be, don't be bearish when the market is still being bullish. And then, you know, if it starts to show some weakness, okay, maybe I can get a bear call on and create a rubber ducky or technically an iron condor. Uh, good question from Brendan, and and you know again, I, this is a strategy and tactic that Tim has been using, and it's one that works for him. It's not something that doesn't necessarily work for everybody, and I right. think we all have to find our own niche and groove here. Um, uh, one one that I'll answer, and one I'm going to ask you, Tim. Uh, Brendan says, if I get paid five hundred three times a week versus paid fifteen hundred dollars once a week, I could give a shit. I prefer the latter because I can set the trade and then go about my week. Ab absolutely. However. What are you going to make that fifteen hundred? What what trade are you going to be looking for to make that fifteen hundred a week? Right, you might be bouncing from asset to asset. I think what makes this special right. is it's always the same thing, right? So you start to one thing that you'll know, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this already, Brendan, and, and others, is if you trade the same thing regularly, you start to gain a real familiarity with how it works. What are the actions of it? It's like being a babysitter, right? right? If you if you babysit a different kid every week, you're not going to know shit about these kids. But if you babysit the same kid every week. You start to learn his actions, how they operate, how you can control them. In this case, we're trying to control the stock. So to me, I think that there's a certain um, benefit to this three-day-a-week strategy because it's the same thing, same rules, same structure. Um, then the other side of this question, which Brendan sent in also, um, where was it? Brendan, you had some good comments in here. Well, is that when you're getting such low premium on spread? Yeah, but what's low premium? You know, like I said, 40, 40 cents is an 8.7% return for the day. And that's what really kind of turned me around in my trading is, you know, if I couldn't make a thousand bucks, don't even bother with the trade. Then I thought, how stupid is that? So now I look at anytime I can cover my commissions, I'm okay with the trade. Mm -hmm. But but when, when I started looking at, you know, because I've made a hundred bucks on a couple of trades and it's like, these suck. And then my coach that I had at the time said, but that was a 3% return for the month. Yeah. yeah, the bank doesn't take percent returns. They seem to want cash. But 3% a month is 36% a year. That's outperforming the majority of the financial advisors out there. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's something my mom taught me when I was about 12. Fast nickels are better than a slow dime. <laughs> and, and these days, if I could get 40 cents three times a week, that's good. And then I go and look at a, going out 30 days and I get 60 cents. Well, I'd have I'd rather get 30 cent or 40 cents three times a week for a month rather than 50, 50 or 60 cents once. Right. Like I said, I'm not looking for the home runs. I'm just looking for conservative, consistent returns to pay the bills. Right. And that's why I quit in July. <laughs> and and I think that that's the important part here is when you're looking at the the strategy you know, uh, Brendan, one of the comments was, well, the premium is not, it's just not enough meat on the bone. Well, you don't have to go out to a delta of, of five or 18. You know, you could you could up it next to you go to 20, 30, but now all of a sudden you're increasing your chance of that ending up in the money. And the whole point of these are, you're selling ice cubes. You want them to melt, right? You yeah. want them to expire worthless. And 
going so far out, uh, you know, obviously increases the chance they're going to expire worthless, but you could ratchet that up. You're obviously going to get more premium, but then you run the risk of, of ex entering or finishing in the money. And, and to me, that's that trade off, you know, and yeah. I, I love your attitude of fast nickel, slow dimes. You know, you're not taking huge risks here. Um, but you could definitely step it up and increase your rate of return on your winning trades, but you're going to lose a lot more often. And you're going to create an ulcer maybe. <laughs> Because watching it sometimes will drive you crazy, especially these days, the way the market moves. But, you know, it's it's always a trade-off between risk and a reward. And I didn't even realize this till I started putting things together for my tax guy. And I had 468 trades last year, had 46 losses, 90.5% wins. And like I said, they're, you know, they're, they're not, you know, two, 300% returns, but I'm okay Make, if I do 10 contracts, say, and I get 40 and 40, I make 800 bucks three times a week. I think that's $2,400 or so. Two, four, six, eight thousand, nine thousand dollars a month. Well, I'm okay with that. Right, right. Um, I got a lot of people. Brendan has a good one. I think everybody loves these types of things. But says I would love for Tim to do a trade over the shoulder session so we could see really see it in action. This is the challenge, obviously. Uh, you know, we talk about a strategy for stocks, futures, forex. Generally, those are one direct, one dimensional. I can go long, I can go short. Period. That's it. Yeah. But having the complexity of all the different options, things, I think for most, including myself, can be confusing sometimes. Um, I know you don't do over the shoulder, but you do do videos. Uh, how can one find out more information about what send, you're doing? Send me an email at timblotzer at yahoo.com. I usually do after the market close on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then I do more of a teaching session on Saturday mornings. And of course, I. I charge now because it was getting out of hand doing it for free with almost 500 people. Uh, so I like to have somebody with some option experience and to try and help you fine tune that. I look at this strategy as here's your strategy to pay your bills, you know, generate conservative, consistent returns. Now this is paying my bills and maybe it starts to creep into replacing your salary. And then you have some decisions, I call it freedom, where you get to do all that. But, you know, pull, if you put the SPX chart back up again, yep. I'd show you just in looking at it where I would get in. And, you know, and I like I said, ideally I want it to expire worthless. Right. Uh, let's see. So I put out your, I, want to, I was doing it live as you were talking. It's uh, oh, Tim, okay. Tim Blotzer at Yahoo.com, right? Yep. Okay. So um, I put it on the screen so you guys can email him there. Uh, let's see, there's a code. You got a pretty complex question. Do you ever do zero DT calendars with the SPX? Zero day days to expiration. expiration. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Right. Uh, I get in Monday and it expires Monday. I get in Wednesday. And somebody said to me one time, he said, well, you're just a day trader. I said, I'm not a day trader. Then I realized, oh, yes, I am. But I'm not doing what a day trader usually does. I'm not scalping for a couple of pennies. I'm making trades based on my checklist. Yeah, I'm trying. I, code, code. I don't quite get your question all the way. He says he's asking about that same thing. He says enter between 11:20, 11:50 a.m. non-trend day. Sell one at the money or plus or nope. minus five call. Nope. 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 It's it's five to eighteen delta. Some days that's you know ten strikes away from the current price. Sometimes it's you know, eight or ten. It just depends on what's going on in the market. What's the volatility? You know, and the more mm -hmm. volatility, the further you can get away and the more premium you can get. And I use that strategy for earnings plays. You know, I'm looking for a stock that's over a hundred bucks, has over a hundred percent implied volatility, and I'm looking at that five to eighteen delta, and I'm not, you know, Normally, on a normal trade doing the SPX, I'm just looking for 25 cents to 40 cents. Mm -hmm. 25 bucks a contract, 40 cents, 40 bucks a contract. When, when, we the, when, when we talked yesterday, you talked about DocuSign. You want to explain a little yeah. bit on the DocuSign? Sure. So looking at DocuSign, it has earnings on Thursday, which is great because I like when they announce on Thursday after the market because then it's done on Friday. And I think it's at 120. Let me see. Yeah, we are at 213 on, on, right now. Yeah, 213 implied volatility. Normal volatility oh, on right. most stocks is about 20%. When they're going into earnings, because what's going to happen? I don't know. Actually, 120%, you 
is for this week and going into Thursday. I won't do the trade until Thursday before the market closes, probably about the last hour. And, oh, it was up 20 bucks today. Why didn't you get in then? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what it's going to do. But all I can do is put the odds in my favor. So if I look at DocuSign for Thursday, and it's going to be after the market closes, and it's 120%, my checklist, first of all, it's got to be liquid. And today it traded 4.4 million shares. Then I look at the options. Does it have 300 in volume and uh, over 10,000 in open interest? Because I... You know, liquidity is critical to your trading because you can get into any trade, but getting out is a whole different thing. If it doesn't have the liquidity or the bid and the ask is huge, and take a look at uh, Priceline is uh, bookings now. Look, you look at bookings, the difference between the bid and the ask is about three or four dollars. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, you buy it, and as soon as you get in, you're down four bucks a share. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So, and looking at DocuSign, now I'll go and I'll look and see, okay, we, we got the liquidity, and now after market, the bid and the ask is not. I think I lost you. Lost you, Tim. I was just going to ask him about GameStop as well. <laughs> Something happened there. We just lost you. You heard his phone beep and then something happened there. All right, well, I will hopefully get him to uh, come back on here and further elaborate. But, uh, God, there are so many things. I'm trying to keep track of all the different pieces because I know a lot of you are asking questions. Some of your minds are spinning. Um, yeah, we, we just lost him on Skype. So I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. <laughs> Jeez. Got to love technology today. Um, you're right. And there's some great comments that have been coming through here. Brennan says, more like a leg and out modified iron condor. Exactly right. And that's what he said at the beginning. It's not an iron condor. It's it's picking the direction that's working at that moment in time, legging into it, and then putting on the second leg, which he calls out the rubber ducky. Uh, other questions. He's still teaching for OTA. No, he does not. He teaches his... Um, he teaches for himself now. You can find out more information by uh, emailing him. I had his name on the screen there. It's Tim Blotzer at yahoo.com to find out more information about that. Um, what else? The other part here, Alan says, sounds about right for a 90% win rate. Yes, um, especially, and again, if he's doing deltas that are, you know, 5 to 18, he's really looking at 95 to 82% win rate. And if you look at statistics, he's not getting huge winners. I, I think that's the big thing you got to understand here is he's not getting big winners on these, but what he is doing is he's becoming more consistent. And I feel that this is pretty important because as someone who's traded extremely active over the years, if you lose a lot, so let's say you weren't picking a delta of 5 to 18, but you were doing a delta of 30, all of a sudden your, your amount of losses are going to be much higher. And of course, the extent of those losses is all going to be dictated by your stop losses and how you manage that trade. You're not going to go to full max loss on these, so you got to manage it there. But still losing that much starts to take a toll on you mentally, right? Uh, show of hands or agree with me or say yes or no, but how many of you have gone on a... Uh, a losing streak where you start taking bigger losses and you lose a lot and you start to feel like a loser and psychologically in your brain it starts to creep in there and you tell yourself I'm a failure I suck at this I can't do this anymore something's wrong with me right how many has that happened to anybody in this group I'm sure it has it's probably happened to every single one of you if you haven't you haven't traded long enough even after doing it for 20 years sometimes you I get these moments where I break down and you're like God can this can I really be this bad I mean, how do I go on a losing streak for five days in a row? That's incredible. It doesn't happen. And then you get yourself out of it. But um, you know, to me, that is the key here. Is he's putting himself in a position where the trades themselves aren't making huge money. They're nice rate of return, but he's also not taking a lot of losses. So that psychological defeatist attitude that comes into place um, will be removed. Brennan says, no, I don't have normal emotions anymore from losing money. Yes, right? <laughs> it changes you, right? Oh, man. Especially when you start taking big losses. I mean, that's what really damages your psyche. So, you know, for me, um, one of the stories I wrote when I was used to do a blog, I did a blog and I was talking about probably one of the best baseball hitters of my generation. And, and, oh, great. Here we go again. You there? Here, I can hear you. All right, hold on. Let me finish this story, and then we'll wrap it up with okay. you. Um, one of the best pure baseball hitters of my generation, who I, I am not a fan of the New York Yankees. I think they just buy themselves the World Series all the time and whatever. I'm more of a San Francisco Giants fan. But, uh, but one of the best hitters ever, 
is Derek Jeter. And this guy batted 305 or 315 lifetime. That means that he struck out like 69% of the time. He struck or sorry, yeah, 69% of the time he'd strike out. And he went straight to the Hall of Fame. First ballot Hall of Famer. And if you think about it, if you can bat 30 per 300 in professional baseball, you'll make it to the Hall of Fame first ballot, no question about it, because it's so hard to do. And he wasn't a big home run hitter. He rarely hit home runs. If he did, it was like, wow, okay, great. You know, I wasn't trying to do that. I was just swinging and trying to make contact and put the ball in the gaps, right? Get on base. And for me, this is the better mentality than trying to hit home runs like I used to years ago, because if you are a base hitter, you can very easily turn a single into a double. And sometimes the outfielders make errors. And next thing you know, you're on third base and screaming for home. And sometimes you do hit that in the park home run, but it's never the main objective. So... Yes, Alex says, will the thrill, a boy. <laughs> remember that swing? <laughs> I actually remember Jeffrey Leonard was the best with the wounded duck arm hanging down as he'd hit a home run just to rub it in the people's faces. Anyway. Um, too young. Yeah. And, and yes, I, I agree Will's with you, Todd. I am not a Barry Bonds fan. I don't know, if, you, if you stuck a needle in your arm and cheated your way and do it to the Hall of Fame, I'm not a fan of yours. But anyway. Um, so, yeah, there we go. That was my, my synopsis of it. And I think that, you know, you have to put aside the money-making return a pure number for the safety of not having a lot of losing trades. And that's where this one comes in. You could take the basic strategy that Tim's talking about and bump up that delta, like I say, and go to a 30. You're gonna have much greater rates of return, big ones. However, you're gonna be stopped out a lot more. And that's that balance we all have to find. And doing this for many years, 13 years now, Tim has said, this is the number I'm comfortable with. He could go even further, get a delta of three and have very, very tiny little profits and almost never lose, right? I mean, that's one strategy as well, but he found the medium that fits him. There you go. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Can you hear me? I got you loud and clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you know, it's like I said, too bad you're too young. I used to watch Willie Mays and McCovey and all those good guys. But you know, it's and and actually going for maybe a three to eight delta is a good strategy for your retirement account. Right. Because yeah. you can go and take a higher probability that it's going to be in the money at expiration if you're buying, or it's going to be a higher probability of out of the money if you're selling, and you could do more contracts. So if you do, say, a five delta, now you get a 95%, you're using a bigger chunk of money in your retirement account, do right. 20, 30, 50 contracts, whatever, whatever your account can handle. Yeah, no, I think that that's a you know great a great point. But we all have to define our own risks, right? We have to figure out exactly what we're capable of handling. Um, and many of us will look at it from the perspective of how much I'm willing to lose on every trade. But there's multiple factors that make us winners or losers. And for me, one of those obviously is the amount we're willing to risk per trade. The other one is how often am I willing to lose, right? You know, there needs to be a certain stop loss that you put in place mentally of how many days in a row am I going to lose? And by the way that you've structured it, you found that sweet spot for you, and and I think that that's yeah. great. Everybody's going to have to do differently. Yeah, and, and it's 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 you know what's my risk tolerance? And I look at you know when I start with somebody doing this, it's I'll tell them do ten to twenty simulated trades a week, and you do it in three steps. One. If you haven't used the platform before, get used to how does the platform work? How do I get in? How do I get out? How do I monitor the trade? All that stuff. Then the second step is, okay, now start doing simulated trades following your rules. And when you get good at that, if you're 70, 80% wins at that stage, then you set up your account, your simulated account for what you would be trading with, with your real money account. And then start doing trades. and over and over and over again you can't get hurt in simulation it's okay to make a bunch of trades yep. and then when you're 70 80 percent correct in those trades then you start trading real money start out with one contract because now you're emotionally involved in the decision and okay then you start gradually working up to your proper position size because you know as emotions go up logic and reason go down <laughs> that they do. And I'm looking right at the sign on top of my computer that says, don't be greedy, don't be stupid, follow the rules. Why? Because I've been greedy, I've been stupid, and I've broken the rules. That doesn't work real well. Hmm. It does. It works great if you want to lose money. If, if you follow the rules, yeah, and all that. <laughs> all right. When we stray and we get greedy, that, that's what it starts to hurt. 
Excellent. Guys, I've got Tim's email on the screen there. It's timblotzer at yahoo.com if you want to know more about that kind of three-day-a-week rubber ducky strategy that he's got. Uh, think of a lot, there, It's a very interesting and compelling strategy, and, and certainly it's not going to be for everybody, but as he mentioned, you know, these are we can allocate different types of portfolio to them. One could be more active, which might give you a, you know, a higher rate of return. If you're a longer-term investor, you go off something that's even harder to um, to get stopped out of or get take losses on and generate a smaller rate of return. So anyway, thanks, Tim, for joining us. I, sorry for all the technical difficulties today. These things happen. Like it's just, <laughs> but I, I look forward to uh, getting you back on again soon. We'll do a we'll do a, a tech test first before this. Yes. See, you talked about California. You're out here in Nevada, and you, now your internet doesn't work, man. I don't know. It's not worth it. Well, that's why I moved here. I found out they had internet here, so I thought it would work. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm worried about it. I'm looking at a place up in Big Bear, and I'm hearing that the internet is terrible. And I'm like, I kept thinking, I'm going to go broadcast the show from up there and just live in the mountains for a couple days a week. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of doing this. True. You, you know, up, down, or sideways, there's a way to make money with options, and you can do it anywhere. All yeah. you need is the internet. Absolutely. That's All right. Viable. <laughs> when it's viable, yeah. All right, my friend. Well, hey, thanks so much for coming on today. I do appreciate it. Uh, I'll get you back on again next month, and we'll talk about some more earnings. So we got some more coming up next month. And you know, thanks again, Merlin. And I, I still have never met anybody that's more knowledgeable about so many things in the market. <laughs> I can't keep up. I'm easily confused. So <laughs> I bow to your. No. Well, just tune into the show. Watch the show regularly. We'll catch you up. <laughs> you have a show? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, it's surprising. I do, yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Take it. All right, guys, that was Tim Blotzer. Sorry for the little uh, technology snafus out there today. I don't know what was going on, but we, we made the most of it. Um, and I love that you guys are so into this discussion today. Some not liking it, some liking it. That's fine. I know that some people look at it and go, nah, it's not going to work for me. That's absolutely right. And all trading styles don't work for everybody. But what is interesting for me uh, is when we bring on these types of trade, well, not these types, when we bring on different traders and you learn about their strategies and tactics, we can start to digest pieces of information about what they do or demo trade that style or paper trade to see is this going to fit my personality type? I love what Brendan wrote in here. Brendan, this is a good one. He says, I'm a heretic. I'm like the equivalent of a, of a market witch doctor who is domesticated by OTA. I mainly do daily and weekly charts with monthly for context, and I'm an information glutton. You know yourself, right? You figured out your style, and how did you figure it out? You were trying to do a bunch of shorter-term stuff, and it wasn't working for you. Whatever the reasons may be why that short-term stuff wasn't working, you found your sweet spot is the longer term. Great. Now, maybe we could do something here with Tim's strategy and modify it a little bit to, to fit yours. Um, personally, I don't think it'll work because, Brendan, I know you are the home run hitter. You're, you're swinging for the fences, and you take some pretty big chances on your investment selection. But others are going to be much more risk averse, right? They're going to be looking for things that aren't dangerous at all. Just, you know, I'm going to bunt myself to first base. Hey, however you get to first base, fine with me as long as you get there. And this is where that discussion we talked about, I think, uh, Monday. Was it Monday? That was yesterday. Uh, about journaling, right? And looking at journaling as a resource for us to understand what's working best, what tactic. Is, is a 5 to 18 delta working best for you in the strategy, or is it going to be a 30 to 40 delta, right? These types of things, we won't know until we start implementing them on our own and figuring out how they work with our personality type. So that's important. Uh, Tim also walked through some important things, which I thought were great, which was... I liked his analysis of the futures markets before he made the options trade. You could tell very clearly it was paramount to him to look and see what was the characteristics of the market that day. That helped him choose which leg to get in on on that iron condor or the rubber ducky. And, and that's important, right? You don't just jump in all at once. It's saying, I'm going to optimize my entries based off what the market's doing, what the VIX is doing, what advanced decliners are doing. So these different tools, and for some of you don't know what those are, we can cover that another time. Uh, but these are basically decision support tools. They're measurements like a stethoscope on the market saying, here's how it's performing right now. And once he understood that, he made a more informed decision about the trade he was going to take. And even though the the probability or reward to risk ratio might have not been very good, right? It might have been a reward of one and risking three. In his mind, because of all these supporting factors, it it made that probability of the reward of one much more achievable to attain because he had all these decision support factors behind him. So, hopefully, I explained that right. Um, options are absolutely very very cool, Saw, but they're a little bit confusing. You know, it's a it's a new language for most people. It's uh, it's a dangerous place if you don't know what you're doing or you do it wrong. But uh, I thought Tim did a pretty good job out there explaining the 
rubber ducky strategy and some of the things he looks at hopefully uh, piqued your interest and you guys might discover more about how it might help you. Brendan says allocation is the best risk control. The best risk control is share size or contracts. If that's what you mean by allocations, it's just the if you don't want to take on more risk, you trade less contracts or lots or, or shares, right? That's the single greatest way to control your risk is through the quantity of whatever asset is that you're trading. And then you start to look at things like diversification and stop losses, probability, all these different metrics. And then we can start to minimize or manage our risk even better. Yes, God, lots of moving parts. And that's why I've been, years ago, I told myself, it's like French, right? I, years ago, I studied French, three years in high school, and then I went to France multiple times. I did business there, and I'd never been treated with more disrespect in my life than I did in Paris, so I boycotted French. Or French. I did the same thing with options when I was trading, God, I don't know, back in 2003, 4, 5, I would trade with some Italian guys that were just great options traders and they kept trying to teach me like, I don't want to learn it, too confusing. I like the simplicity of equities and futures and Forex. Um, but options are certainly one of the greatest tools out there. It just takes a little bit longer to learn them. Okay. All right, that's gonna do it. Let's go to uh, your economic calendar for tomorrow. Here's what we got cooking for tomorrow. Economic calendar for the 10th. I should probably bring it up so you guys can see it, huh? Um, it is a huge day tomorrow, and actually very excited because we're going to have Bill Addis on the show to talk about this. We had Stephen Van Meter on the program the other day talking about how he feels there's going to be a bond melt-up, right? These yields are going to collapse. Well, we saw a pretty nice spike today in bond prices, yields dropping a little bit, but tomorrow is the really important day, um, tomorrow and Thursday. Now, on Wednesday, you can see here at 10 a.m., I think I could even put a little red box around the U.S. data if you like. There you go. You guys can see... You have the 10-year bond auction. That'll be at 10.01 in the morning Pacific time. So that's gonna be California time. If you're on the East Coast, just add three hours to it. But that's that 10-year bond auction. That'll be very telling to see what the yield's gonna look like, what the demand is for this auction. And then to, on Thursday, you actually have the 30-year as well. You also have consumer price index, which is, is a really important piece of data. They're expecting it to pop up just a little bit but nothing overly, overly crazy. That said, remember, we've had Powell talking about how inflation is starting to get a little bit high and he's a little bit concerned. This might be an important announcement with regards to CPI and there'll be PPI later on in the week. So you have some pretty important announcements for the US with um, a Canadian rate statement. That's a, I don't want to overshadow that at all. That's expected to say just the same, but it can always create waves. That'll be at 7 a.m. Pacific. US has CPI and crude oil inventories as well as that 10-year bond auction. So a ton of stuff going on for the US equity markets. All right, moving on to your earnings calendar for tomorrow. Not a lot of major names, one in particular, Oracle, that's the only one that's got a set time there. You can see everything else, SoftBank, uh, Pinduo Duo, and Adidas um, are scheduled to have earnings, but since they're international, they don't have a time selected here. So Oracle is the only one that really reporting earnings tomorrow. And that will be after the market close. All right, uh, let's see what time we at. I'm gonna end it early, I think. I'm gonna, gonna go get on, the, get on the phone, make some phone calls here. Um, all right, sorry about the tech issues. That was a, an odd one, but it happens every now and again, the beauty of doing something live. As I mentioned, tomorrow I'm gonna have Tim Blotzer on the program, so, or Tim Blotzer, Bill Addis on the program. We had Tim Blotzer today, which you can email him at timblotzer at yahoo.com, but Bill Addis will be our guest. We've had a lot of very interesting discussions about bonds, both with Bill Addis, both with um, Jim Rogers and uh, Stephen Van Meter. I'm curious to see what Bill's thoughts are, because I'll, I'll try to, get him up to speed with what Steven Van Meter was saying, which I thought was very interesting, talking about this huge short squeeze coming in the bond market. Could it happen? I don't know. Love to get Bill's perspective, because Bill's been trading bonds for 40 plus years, so we'll see what he thinks about that one. Anyway, that will do it for me, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Again, sorry for the uh, the issues. We will make it better next time. Hopefully, you will join us tomorrow. So if you like today's show, give me a thumbs up. If you're new, click that subscribe button. I will see you tomorrow with Bill Addis talking bonds. Take care.